Hi, I'm Deborah Sims. I'm a CLL patient from Melbourne in Australia and I'm joined by Sharon who is the CEO of Lymphoma Australia and Zach Pemberton-Whiteley who is the Patient Advocacy Director for Leukaemia Care UK. Now this is the first time you two have actually met and you're fighting issues on the same page. Uh, we've got very similar systems so I, th I thought we'd you know, start by asking what's brought you to ASH, why does it matter, Sharon? Well, coming to ASH means that we're actually able to set, give information back to our patients in our countries about the latest treatments, the trials, uh, treatment pathways, outcomes. And what that means is those patients, they've got information and information is power. And for that way, then they can actually hopefully change the outcomes for themselves with the disease that they're trying to work with as well. Um, part of the reason we're filming all these videos is to portray that information back to patients. Um, but the second thing is we get involved in decisions about uh, access to treatment. So there's something called health technology appraisals in the UK and I think you have that in Australia as well. Um, which is essentially a review of whether or not a drug should be reimbursed and funded, in our case on the National Health Service. Um, so whenever a decision is being made about a leukaemia drug, we get involved, we campaign on behalf of leukaemia patients as to why they should have access to these, where the value is for them. And to do that, we need access to the latest data, and that data is being presented here at ASH. And some of that data today that we heard in particular was very exciting developments with combination therapies. Uh, we don't need to name all the drugs, but there were some significant updates um, in terms of some of these co combination therapies leading to time fixed duration treatment and leading to really strong depth of remissions um, which we haven't really seen before um, outside of chemotherapy. What we're doing today is so much more advanced than what we were doing a decade ago and the combination therapies whilst they're challenging in terms of cost in terms of outcomes to patients they can really make a difference and also by then putting overlaying on that as well, the genomics and the mutations, it means that we're actually getting patients the right treatment for them, not the treatment that we think they might need, but the one that will really work for them. So it is exciting times, but challenging times at the same time. One of the things we do need to work out is how we get this in the hands of patients. Science is just science unless patients have access to these treatments. If, if they don't have access, it doesn't really mean anything. Um, and combination therapies present quite a different challenge with that. Um, so where you have like a, a backbone therapy, which is the treatment people would have been receiving anyway, and then you add another treatment onto that, normally one of the things that happens is you then use the backbone therapy for longer. So if you, um, as a patient, are obviously surviving longer, you're being treated with the original medication for longer. One of the issues we've seen in the UK is the combination therapy in the first place is being reimbursed at the highest possible price. Um, so there's thresholds of cost effectiveness and it's already being reimbursed at that threshold. And what that means is if you then have that treatment for say five years instead of three years because you're adding another drug into the mix, the original drug is essentially being reimbursed for five years at the full price. So this new drug, the question of how do you afford to reimburse these things on top of the original drug um, becomes really key. And I mean we don't really want to care about the price, we don't care about drug companies getting <laughs> reimbursed for these things. What we care about is patients having access. And this is certainly going to present a barrier to this in the future. We've seen reports coming out in the UK of drugs that are not cost effective at zero price. That means if you give away this new drug for free, you still can't get it reimbursed because of the cost of originator backbone therapies. And this is not, this is a global problem. It, this is a global problem, but mm. it is such a huge problem that we actually do need to get an answer to it. And then also we need to also go back a step to look at the diagnostics. So our HTA systems also have to acknowledge that unless they do the proper diagnostics, they are still not necessarily giving the patient the right treatment. And it, if, if it is a combination therapy, then how are we going to fund it and get the treatment or the access pathway established so that even the companies have an incentive to put them in? Because at the moment, even in countries like Australia, it's like, well, the patient group is too small. We don't have the incentive to even submit for an approval process, which is going to be detrimental potentially to patients. Where we're using these combinations, we need mechanisms in place 
that are agreed between all stakeholders as to how the split of this price is going to be calculated. It's not about two companies coming up with an agreement. We need to have formal processes for how these are done. Um, and that, again, that needs all stakeholders to be involved. But the second thing that that raises is something called multi-indication pricing. And what that means is where the same drug is being used in different areas, whether that's different diseases, or whether that means two different groups um, within the same blood cancer type, for example, maybe one in combination and one not in combination, we need different prices for those. Um, so in the UK, we have something called value-based pricing, and that means essentially you reimburse for the benefit that you get from the treatment. And we have a system that has that, but only allows one price. So what that then means is you have a drug being re reimbursed in one population and in the other you're stuck with the same price, which if that, that might mean that the drug can be available, but what it might mean is if, as many companies have done, they bring the biggest population to market, the one that makes the most profit, and the one that helps the most patients, but equally it's, it's the most profitable one, they bring that indication to market at the price that's cost effective, and then they bring a smaller subpopulation in other areas to market might be a different disease, um, but they're stuck with the originator price. I mean, obviously, they're given the option they can lower the price for both of them, but as a company, they're going to struggle to do that. They have responsibilities to shareholders. Um, we can talk about the ethics of pricing if we want for a while, but realistically, they're not going to lower the price for a small subpopulation. And we're then seeing issues in the UK with those secondary indications not being reimbursed. If you're going to have value-based pricing, you need pricing that's flexible for multiple indications. It's just totally unacceptable. And unfortunately, the bottom line is that patients will miss out. Or I've even heard where clinicians are saying, well, why are we even offering these combination therapies to patients even in a clinical trial if we know it's never going to get to the bigger population anyway? And I think that is just a real dilemma then for all of us as well. And like you said, there's multi-stakeholders in this. So to get everybody to agree on how this is going to progress is going to be a huge challenge. And we have to be there. Patients need to be there to make sure that there is some fairness so that we're actually going to get these drugs to patients. One of the things that quite often doesn't get discussed is trials do themselves offer access for patients. Um, in certain places, trials are viewed as everyone says, am I being a guinea pig? Um, trials in most cases, particularly in the field of cancer, mean your alternative treatment option is the standard of care you would have received otherwise. So your option is an experimental new therapy, which may or may not be right for you, or the comparator that you would get reimbursed normally. And what that means is if you do want to access this particular experimental therapy, you can get it, and at a point which, to your point, it may never become reimbursed in certain countries in the future. And so, so I think there is a value to doing clinical trials in countries, even if they do then not get reimbursed. Although obviously we want them reimbursed for, so all patients can access. Definitely, but without a pathway to even put the submission in, we're going to struggle. So I'm thinking of there can be combination therapies that are actually not that expensive in, you know, in the value of everything, but there's that, if there's no pathway for it to actually get through the submission process, then patients are going to miss out. And unfortunately, Again, patients know about this because of their global connections. So what might be approved in America is then not getting approved in the UK or Australia because we don't have those pathways. And then we're seeing things that we're seeing in particular in Australia where because of genomics, patients are now finding out that their tumour, their, their cancer may respond to you know, a, a PD-1 inhibitor that is available for melanoma, but not available for their lymphoma. And they're actually importing it and paying it and lying in a hospital bed, having it infused next to someone who is getting it funded for their, for their different cancer. So, I mean, do you think there is a, we will see a time where because of genomics, we, we will see drugs approved for the target molecule? rather than for the cancer, or that would just blow everyone's minds in terms of cost. So is there ever going to be something in the future is a, a difficult question to answer. I think in the near future, I don't see anything like that happening. Certainly in the UK, the way the system is set up, we do a trial, we run evidence, we show that it works in a particular area, um, we talk about how much uncertainty there is, and then we reimburse it, hopefully, or don't reimburse it, unfortunately sometimes, for a particular patient population. 
it's not, in, in many cases, it's usually not for, say, all CLL patients. It's CLL patients um, who meet a particular criteria. Maybe they've had prior treatment, maybe they have a particular mutation. Um, so so I, don't, I don't personally see that happening, and I'm not sure that that would be the right way for a system to go anyway. We're talking about a pan-tumor approach now, but the problem is sometimes, even though it may be attacking the same mutation, it may work in one cancer group, but it's not going to work in the other cancer group. So, and we haven't had the evidence, we've just said, it looks like it's going to work over there because of the mutations, but it doesn't always work that way either. So again, it's about having, keeping to the values of the HTA system as well, which is about, we need the evidence because at the end of the day, we don't want patients being given PD-1s or whatever, and then finding out that it absolutely wasn't going to work for that group either. And I mean, that doesn't mean we can't run trials yes. in different areas. Mm -hmm. I mean, that we have to obviously have a hypothesis that we think these things are going to work and some evidence, usually from testing in the lab, that we think these yeah. are going to be active so in we, different diseases. Yeah, we get that and then we run a trial and then we would go to, I think, more looking at a pan tumour for that mm -hmm. particular um, medicine. And, and the point there is about, if we're talking about reimbursing these things in different countries, you have to know there is a value to these medicines being brought. Um, I think all patients should be able to access treatments, but at the point that we've shown this is beneficial for them, not just reimbursing absolutely everything that moves. We need to, we have fixed budgets, we need to make sure we're spending our money on the areas where we know they have the value for patients. And then having the data to back up the outcomes as well, so we've got that evidence too. So the other thing that's really come out today has been the new data around time-limited therapies compared to continuous therapies and the benefits that we're seeing from these combination therapies. What did you, what was your reaction to what we heard today? So the interesting thing about the different options patients are being presented here with treatments of a fixed uh, fixed treatment duration compared to um, continuous therapies where they're going to have this either until disease progression or until um, unknown point in the future. It's a really difficult choice um, and it's something that we're seeing different patients are having completely different views on it. Um, Leukemia Care actually did a focus group and a survey that we submitted to IWCLL earlier this year where the answer coming out from patients in many cases really was we don't know. Different people have different views as to whether it's a good thing or not. Um, I mean certainly from a healthcare system perspective having treatments for a fixed treatment duration means that you're only paying for a drug for a certain period of time. It means patients in many cases are only having side effects for a certain period of time. Um, but there's also the worry that comes with you've had treatment for a period and you're now lo no longer being treated in diseases like CLL. Is it great that you're experiencing this period of no treatment or are you worried about what's going to happen should you need another line of treatment? Um, and for drugs like venetoclax where you have the option to use it in combination with venetoclax with tuximab and various other mm. different combinations. Do people want that or do people want venetoclax monotherapy which you have on a continuous basis? Mm. Really difficult choice. We don't always know the long-term adverse events of actually being continually on treatment. So is that actually better for the patient or worse for the patient? And also the trial design can actually also determine which way it's going to go, whether it's fixed treatment time or a continuous time. Um, so I guess, yeah, there's always going to be different opinions on it. It may be dependent on the subtype and what they're actually trying to achieve as well. We've been seeing this in chronic myeloid leukaemia. Um, so we've had years where drugs like imatinib and then other TKIs, where for years patients have been told, you need to stay on this for the rest of your life. Um, and then after the, over the last three, years or so, we've been talking about treatment-free remission, where suddenly you can stop taking these drugs that you were told you needed every day for yeah. the rest of your life, and you can stay in remission. In some cases, I know people five plus years off treatment. Um, and it's interesting to see the differences between patients who were told you need to take this for the rest of your life, where there are all kinds of concerns, people really worried about stopping, compared to patients who are being diagnosed with CML now, who've heard about treatment-free remission and who are saying, oh, how quickly can I stop taking these treatments? Um, and, the, and the other thing we saw coming through there was even when patients are stopping, they're then getting withdrawal effects because um, they've been on the treatment for so long 
um, and all kinds of other things that are being masked by some of these kinase pathways. And we can use examples even like with uh, melanoma where it's been approved with the immunotherapy that they take it until disease progression. But for example, in Hodgkin's lymphoma, it's only been approved for a fixed period of two years time. So then the patients say, well, why are we different to that group? But again, it gets back down to that trial design again. And, and that's where I was going to take this actually, because you, you're touching on trial design. That's another really important thing that you guys do. You are there making sure that patients are getting access to the best trials. You're there promoting you know, trials to patient groups, because particularly in Australia, and I presume it will be the same in the UK, this is the only way patients, some patients are going to be able to access these medications. They're not going to be approved for many, many years. So if you can get onto the right trial at the right time with a good um, therapy, there's a lot of upside to that. Yeah, and there's another challenge for us, because like you say, it's the right trial at the right time, and what happens when those trial closes, but you're still waiting for it to be reimbursed in your country as well. So then there's this whole gap of patients that are actually going to miss out on treatment. So for us, it's about advocating to get things approved as quickly as we can, but also within the trial design, I mean, it's always about the patient voice should be there. The patient voice isn't always there, but we're working to make sure that we are heard. Isn't it nice designs. to see the investigators who've been presenting actually thank every single oh, yes. one has thanked the patients and their families. Yes. That wasn't happening when I came to ASH no. three or four years ago. So it's mm. wonderful. And that's because patient advocacy groups are actually involved in, you, you know, you're, you've got a poster um, coming up. I mean, it, it, it's great that the, you know, the medical community is actually listening to patient groups as well. So I think there's a couple of really good points there. I think the first one is about patient involvement in research and development. I think it's great to see the progress. We're certainly not there yet. So in patients are not being seen as an equal stakeholder in some of these things, um, which personally really annoys me. At the end of the day, it's the patients who, are, who the treatment's being designed for and when you try and determine what value these therapies offer, everyone asks from whose perspective. There is one perspective, there is no other perspective. These treatments are developed for patients. Everyone else is a surrogate who's making a decision on their behalf, whether that's clinicians, whether that's regulators, whether that's the agencies who are reimbursing these in countries. They make decisions on our behalf. They don't make decisions um, of themselves. They're not God. Um, the second point you made about um, posters, yeah, it's great to see not just ourselves, we've got, um, there's two different posters that I'm involved in, one which is the Global Acute Leukemia Group about a quality of life survey at different points in the acute leukemia pathway, um, and then there's a second one about treatment free remission in CML from the Global CML Advocates Network, um, they've done an absolutely great project on that one, um, and then there's also, I know Lymphoma Coalition have got projects here, and I know other patient groups over the years have had loads of them. And it's great to see people genuinely being um, taken as credible at ASH. Personally, I'd like to see them in some of the oral sessions at some point in the future. Um, EHAR are doing it. EHAR have got whole advocacy tracks, which ASH need to follow suit on. They're years behind on that one. Um, and I'd like to see them change that at some point in the future. Yeah, definitely. But it's certainly great to see... Um, so many patient groups around and also the data being presented at the conferences where the clinicians are going to listen to it. Now you're both going to kill me because fi final question without notice, between now and Ash in San Diego next year, what would be one thing you would like to see? Well I think at the moment they do, patients groups have felt we're welcomed to the meeting. So I, I don't think they're unwelcoming. And uh, But again, like to your point, to be more involved at the meeting, because I think sometimes they don't realise how much we can add value. We're not just there, we have got value to add. So if there can be an oral presentation with patients coming forward about clinical trials, about how are we going to solve some of the big problems that we're all facing, uh, whether it's access to medicines, trials, combination therapies, involve us in the conversation. I would like to see Ash do something similar as well, following what EHAR is doing for advocates um, and making sure they are part of the agenda and making sure that perspective is being included. We're seeing, um, I mean, we're involved in Europe and, and global stuff, and we're seeing much more happening in Europe in terms of the advocacy movement, but also in terms of the clinicians um, talking about it. I was a meeting with uh, John Gribben, 
um, I think it's a couple of months ago now, but he's president of EHAR at the moment, and he was making strong commitments in terms of what EHAR is going to do to include the advocacy community in these things. And it's not about saying we want to be involved in these things, it's about the patient perspective being portrayed. This is a key thing that needs to be talked about, and I'd like to see Ash doing something similar. Well, thank you both. On behalf of patients like myself, thank you so much for all you do for us. You know, I know it's more than a job for both of you and it comes at personal cost. Sharon, you've flown 30 hours to be here. Zach, Zach, it's only been a little while across the pond, but no, thank you, seriously, thank you guys. And uh, let's carry on the conversation.